right, MSI. I'm not one for rousing speeches, but the captain needs our help. So get in there and... You've done. Oh, you're mis. That crackpot's plan is ludicrous. In any other circumstance, no call for you. You unbelievable bitch. Sophia should be the one wasting her time with you, but you killed her. I'll have you hanged, quartered. Bankrupted! Thankfully, you're in a prison already. Find the nearest cell and wait until I'm done here. Then I'll drag you to the executioner myself.
Is that what you think you're doing? This path of wanton societal disruption? You call that being a savior? I call it sabotage. You know what saboteurs get, Captain? Summary executions. In the next room is the finest auto-mechanical purveyor of death ever made. Try not to scratch the paint with your skull. It was fucking expensive. Absolutely not. Akande was always the sociable one, not me. Need I repeat the magic two words? You don't know how glad I am to see you. You lunatic. You broke into the board's own fortress and killed the chairman just to rescue one doddering old man. You are absolutely out of your mind, and I can't begin to thank you enough. Ah! You've broken the board's stranglehold on this colony, and you saved my life. But there's still so much we have yet to accomplish. You and I are going to have to work harder than ever to save Halcyon. I'm afraid the situation is far worse than any of us ever anticipated. Earth has gone dark. We haven't received a single message in three years. There's been no communication, no signals, nothing. Two years ago, the Earth's Directorate's frigate disappeared on their way back to Earth. We don't know what they discovered when they arrived, or if they arrived at all. So we've got to make do on our own. Seems to me that'll make us stronger in the end anyhow. You're quite right. We've got no choice but to make do on our own. You mean... we're all alone out here? Really alone? I'm afraid so, Miss Holcomb. Halcyon is the only home we have left. Returning to Earth is no longer an option. We're in serious trouble, my friend. Do you know what this means for Halcyon? We can't rely on Earth for support anymore. We've been cut loose. We're entirely on our own. Yes, yes, certainly. I'll help however... I don't know what... We have no... You might have heard of the Earth Directorate's frigate. Half the colony's entire military was on that ship. They were returning to Earth when they vanished without a trace. That was two years ago. We haven't heard a word from them since. Whatever happened to Earth likely happened to them. I wasn't trying to hide the truth from you, but after all you've done, I owe you an explanation. Yes? I experimented on the Hope's colonists. Each of my experiments ended in catastrophic failure. Each of my subjects died in agony. 
You are my first and only success. I didn't tell you about the others because I didn't want to burden you. My failures are my own to bear, not yours. You have every right to think of me that way. I know I can never win back your trust, but I'm trying to set things right. My apologies. I need to get a hold of myself. We've far more pressing issues to worry about right now. If you have any more questions, ask me. I'll answer as best I can. Yes, you're right. We must... We're going to... I can't tell you how glad uh, we can. The OSI teaches that everything in the universe happens according to the grand plan. But the stranger that arrived in Halcyon was an unplanned variable. From the moment he landed in Emerald Vale, his actions altered the course of history. The events on Tartarus brought about the end of the board's authority. But the board's mistakes would haunt the colony for decades to come. The damage they left behind would require the work of a generation to repair. Dr. Phineas Wells began reviving a handful of the Hope's colonists, engineers, scientists, technicians, and intellectuals. They were among the brightest minds the Earth had ever sent out into the stars. The Hope's scientists and engineers woke up in a colony descending headlong into total collapse. With no way to return to Earth, they had no choice but to band together and devote themselves to the cause of saving Halcyon. The people of Halcyon were nothing if not hardy. In the absence of the board's authority, many of the colony's settlements banded together with a single purpose in mind, survival. Life was especially hard in the years to come. Some towns dissolved by attrition and starvation, but most of them found a way to carry on. In the years to come, Halcyon was forced to reckon with its newfound freedom. The board was gone, and for better or worse, the colony was responsible for its own destiny. Sanjar's civil liberties and worker-centric policies were slow to catch on with the other corporations. But as Halcyon began its long, arduous journey toward recovery, many of Terra 2's smaller townships started adopting MSI's alternative corporate structure and eventually became entirely self-sufficient. In the coming years, many of these townships managed to eke by, where otherwise they might have starved. Consumed by paranoia, Lilia Hagen took sublight salvage in a controversial direction, openly accusing board officials of an extraterrestrial conspiracy. One day, an accident at the Groundbreaker's docking bay silenced her forever. Time would tell if her replacement could keep the Sublight family together. The collapse of Edgewater left its workers bereft of any purpose in life. Most of them made their way to Adelaide Medevitt's camp, hoping to ingratiate themselves into her favor. Adelaide accepted only a few to her community. The rest were turned away and likely died of starvation. Nevertheless, Adelaide's camp grew into a well-established town. Adelaide McDevitt refused to cooperate with the ongoing effort to save Halcyon from collapse. A sympathetic deserter stole a copy of her research and delivered it to the Hope's scientists. It is unclear how useful Adelaide's research was. An optimistic estimate suggests her work may have bought Halcyon another few years of survival. Adelaide would never know. She died that winter. Under the leadership of June Lake Tennyson, the groundbreaker held firm against corporate influence. The ship's mechanical stability gave June Lake the time to educate a promising generation of engineers schooled in her family's traditions. 
The future of the Groundbreaker looks promising. The rediscovery of the hope and the abandonment of the lifetime employment program forced Byzantium to come to terms with some uncomfortable realities about the state of Halcyon. While Byzantines were reluctant to surrender the luxuries they'd grown accustomed to, the board's diminished authority gave them little choice in the matter. Nearly everyone had to learn to make do with less. Some even had to get jobs. It was a dark time indeed. Even the Gorgon asteroid, though a distant enigma to most of Halcyon, felt the aftershocks of your actions. Olivia and Minnie Ambrose worked together to cure the marauders Adrena Time had created. Through their partnership as scientist and administrator, they discovered the harmony that had eluded them as mother and daughter. And through years of patience and effort, they discovered the means to wean Halcyon from the scourge of Adrena Time. Their work eventually allowed Wells and his scientists to treat many of Halcyon's marauders. As their addiction waned, the colonists who had lived for so long under the thrall of Adrena Time returned to their communities and loved ones and joined in the effort to save Halcyon. In spite of everything, the Gorgon asteroid remained a sobering reminder of the potential for progress and disaster in humanity's most ambitious efforts. The Rizzo's company in Halcyon dissolved after the collapse of the board. Needless to say, the launch of Spectrum Brown was indefinitely delayed. A stockpile of Spectrum Brown remains buried deep beneath the ruins of the old distillery, abandoned to time and attrition. With the dissolution of the board, Ruth Bellamy found herself without the two constants in her life, Byzantine culture and her sister Belinda. In the face of this new reality, she struggled to find a direction for her life. The colony had moved on from Halcyon Helen and would require new heroes in the years to come. And so Ruth Bellamy decided it was time to exit stage left. She quietly disappeared from public view. The dissolution of the board did not mean the dissolution of the ambitions of Cedric Kincannon, the charismatic leader of Sublight Underground. Cedric offered Slug's transportation services to the newly thawed colonists and set to work ferrying resources and food wherever they were most needed. For better or worse, Slug headgear became fashionable in the following years. As the board began to disintegrate, Spencer Woolrich found himself at a crossroads. Cling to what little stardom remained to him, or help usher Halcyon into its new future. To the surprise of many, perhaps himself most of all, Spencer chose the latter option. Having learned a variety of different skills in the many different roles played throughout his lengthy career, Spencer founded a radio serial dedicated to staying alive despite the odds. His subjects included how to survive violent encounters with only grazing wounds, dispense pithy one-liners for tense scenarios, and, of course, how to look good doing both. After a brief attempt at dating Helen as one person rather than two, which both Bertie and Helen found too strange, Bertie struck out on his own to try his hand at raising woolly cows. Many of his former Rangers teammates soon followed, accompanied by the woolly cow the team had originally plied with alcohol. The dairy farm thrived under Bertie's leadership and care. The dairy rangers privately believed that the woolly cows softened Bertie's temper considerably. Although the only one brave enough to say this to his face was promptly headbutted. Due to the board's dissolution, many of the Prophet's old customers no longer found quite the same value in productivity seminars 
that they once had. With her business drying up, the prophet chose to take her followers down a new path. Months later, salvagers on Eridanos found clues leading them to a seemingly abandoned bunker out in the wilderness. Inside, they discovered horribly mangled corpses sacrificed to a blood-scrawled portrait of a sprat-headed deity. The prophet was not among the bodies. Life in Halcyon was sobering for Felix Melstone. The grand revolution he dreamed of never came. There was no great awakening for the colony, no celebrations in the streets. There was only the hard, desperate work of trying to repair a broken colony. Felix never had a head for numbers, but if there was labor to be done, he was there to help. Eventually, Felix realized that the work of a revolution was done with two hands. Once the matter with the Hope colonists was resolved, June Lay bashfully asked Parvati if she'd like to join her permanently on the Groundbreaker, and Parvati enthusiastically, if somewhat awkwardly, agreed. The stories of her adventures spread across the colony, and Parvati soon found herself the center of attention. Having served as the engineer of a renowned spacecraft, tramp freighters and wildcat miners sought her out by name. And in no time, she was a fixture in the Groundbreaker's mechanical ecosystem. She and Jun Lei were never far apart. Nioka returned to Monarch to take another crack at making a permanent life for herself. She formed the Charon Group, an MSI subsidiary of ragtag survivalists and wilderness experts. Anyone in need of a guide, or just looking to throw back a beer and swap stories, could find her camping on the trail or clearing an infestation. Before his untimely death, Captain Alex Hawthorne had plans to restore and modify, for combat purposes, a sanitation and maintenance auto-mechanical that he'd found in a state of disrepair in Emerald Vale's scrapyard. That unit remains broken down and forgotten in the unreliable supply closet to this day. Minister Clark was released from house arrest, and his contact with you gave him a sense of renewed purpose and vigor. Once it became clear that no help would be coming from Earth, he threw his considerable efforts and talents into helping Halcyon manage the crisis before it. As for Dr. Phineas Wells, he spent his remaining years in his orbital lab. Though he was always haunted by the failures of his past, he was determined to make things right by building toward the future. The revival project was hard and painful work, but in the end, despite limited resources, over half the Hope's colonists were successfully revived. Even after Wells passed away, the Hope scientists and engineers worked night and day to pull Halcyon from the brink of collapse. Their efforts continue to this day, which may be reason enough for optimism. Dr. Wells laid the groundwork for the project to save the colony, but he would never live to see the fruits of his labor. He passed away a few years later. His work was carried on by the scientists and engineers he revived. Life will never be the same in Halcyon. It is widely agreed that the colony has a chance of stabilizing within a generation, owing to the hard work and determination of the surviving colonists. Recovery is a distant goal, and the path is long and uncertain. But the people of Halcyon carry on, determined as ever. And what about you, the unplanned variable in the history of Halcyon? Long after Wells passed away, you carried on his work with more energy, determination, and brilliance than he could ever muster. The years that followed were hard, but Halcyon survived by the efforts of the Hope's most promising colonists, the greatest of which was you. No one knows what's happened to Earth, and no one knows what the future has in store for Halcyon. All we know for certain is this. The name of the unreliable and that of its intrepid captain will remain the subject of countless stories for years to come.